Welcome to the University of Melbourne uh, and to this ICT for Life Sciences Forum presentation. I'm Luan Ismahil, the Forum's Executive Director, and on behalf of the Forum sponsors, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. October is a special time for the ICT for Life Sciences Forum because uh, it's when we were uh, established uh, six years ago this month. So uh, in that period, we've um, held almost 70 events and uh, um, attracted an audience of about 15,000 people, which is uh, quite extraordinary, really. We never expected that when we started out six years ago. Our mission really is to um, excite and inform the community about convergent science, the convergence of life sciences, physical sciences, and the engineering sciences, and the wonderful things that that convergence is making possible, particularly in the area of health. This evening's event has been made possible through the support of Illumina and the Victorian Life Sciences Computation Initiative. And you'll see the hashtag that's been uh, prepared for uh, the visit of the speaker to Melbourne this week, so feel free to use that. It's now my uh, pleasure to invite the Director of the Victorian Life Sciences Computation Initiative, Professor Peter Taylor, to um, introduce our speaker. You're welcome. Luan has already done the sponsorship thing, so I won't um, labour that point, but I think both VLSCI and Illumina were delighted to have the opportunity to support this event. And I'd also like to acknowledge one individual, Nick Wong, who was the catalyst in making this happen by putting the various connections together so we could, um, we could make this event occur. Martin earned his qualifications at University of British Columbia on the west coast of Canada and seems to have spent most of his time in that rather attractive part of North America at the Michael Smith Genome Science Center. I don't want to spend a lot of time doing an introduction here because I think it's much more important that he gets a chance to show you what we are able to do now visualizing information. Note that I don't say visualizing data. We have data, we're drowning in it. What we need to do is extract information from the data and visualize that information. And I think what you will see in the next 45 minutes or so is how that can be done in the context of vitally important biological data. And so without further ado, I'd like to ask Martin to come up and start his presentation. Thank you very much. So I don't want to trouble and, and uh, um, traumatize people by, by thinking about past university days. So why don't we start with a, a relaxing uh, video? Trying to capture a narrative that's, that's engaging, that retains the accuracy of the science but has an artistic license to it that compels people to look at it and, and really be visually pleased, but also stimulated to try to figure out what this piece means. There's three billion positions along the genome in which things can go right, in which things can go wrong, and, and one of those places can, can literally change someone's life. very unfortunate that something as frequent, as common as hereditary breast and ovarian cancer should be analyzed and interpreted in a completely closed black box manner. But to me, is just not good medicine. I think when we first get diagnosed, we always get the feeling that we are alone, that nobody else has this mutation. And by looking at this mural, you realize that we're all interconnected. Internally, we have genes that they may work or they may not work, but they make us what we are. 
And now that we're going to free the data, we're going to be able to give the opportunity to people that we survivors might not have had on time. On this piece, maybe you can find them, there are these two long lines here and here. These are the proteins of BRCA1 and BRCA2. And so where your proteins, where your genome is different, is marked by the circles. I don't want other women to have to go through the suffering and the wondering that I grew up with and that my sister grew up with and that she died and took to her grave. It is my information and I want it to be shared. I owe that to my sister and her memory. I was diagnosed with breast cancer when nursing my second daughter. She was three months old. And I'm freeing the data because I want better answers. I don't want removing body parts to be the only option to prevent breast and ovarian cancer. And I certainly don't want that for my children. My data need to be free to help others. It should not be in the hands of one company. If you can use my data to help a race of people or help people in general, then it needs to be free. I'm freeing my data so that in the future, women won't have to decide between motherhood and life. So that men can have some clarity about their own protocols, their own treatment plans. Because I know how high the stakes are. There are different risks for different mutations, and I want that information to be available. We do have part of the puzzle, but unless we get the rest of the puzzle together, we won't have a complete answer. How many more people are going to have breast and ovarian cancer? How many more Latinos? How many more Caucasian, African American, Asian, anybody, you know? We, we're never going to find the answer if we don't free the data. So why did I show you that film, that, that brief video? Um, I think it's because somewhere in the process of sequencing genomes, anal analyzing genomes, and, and being really busy at looking at the data that the genomes are telling us, uh, some of the humanity behind the genome gets lost. Uh, this is Joanna, the, the producer um, of that film. This is the report you get from Myriad, um, Myriad when you're diagnosed. And you look at it, and some of the women didn't even really know whether they were diagnosed with a mutation. They, they didn't know what positive for a deleterious mutation meant. Positive sounds like a good word. Deleterious sounds like a bad word. They could not un interpret this. They couldn't understand it. The impact and the, the, the relevancy of what they were seeing was not in proportion to, to their response because they couldn't understand. So there won't be any ice in the Arctic. We're running out of ice. Now think about how you just responded to that. There won't be any ice in the Arctic. We're running out of ice. Think how you responded to that. Is that art? Is that science? Is that a a way to manipulate you into, into worrying? If it is, that's good, because you should be worried about at least this. So what's the rule is you always put the bear in the first slide. You don't leave it to the end. You, you put the humanity in your story first. You put the emotion in your story first as much as you can, because it's not done enough in science. I sometimes work with people to try to communicate their data better, and this was some communication with a grad student who worked on some clotting factor 
uh, mechanism. And she showed 15 slides, a very complicated mechanism. And if you're in the audience, you might be interested in clotting, but many people might have dozed off a little bit. And then on slide, um, on the next slide, uh, she shows him. And the question is, uh, you know, why, why is he still in a wheelchair? And the more important question, I think, is, you know, why is he on slide 15? The bear goes first. I need to know why I should pay attention and why it's important. And this is the fastest way for me to pay attention. You have me. You have my mind now. You have my, I'm listening. So uh, Richard Feynman is one of my heroes. And, and I believe in what he says here is compassion and, and laughter are indeed a type of understanding that art allows us to, to reach. Um, if we are to truly understand a dog, is it enough to look at its genome? Is it, is it enough to use models to analyze the genome? How, how can we truly understand a dog? Perhaps like this. This tells you something about the dog that the genome does not. This scene captures the essence of what a dog is, at least this one. Lump, that's Picasso, uh, by the way. Much more than the genome. And so if I wanted to talk to you about some organism that you've never met before, I should put this slide first. And that's because we're not just brains in a jar. Okay. We have hearts, too. We have feelings. And so we should address those feelings where possible. And we have to remember that scientists have feelings too. And we forget this um, quite a lot. So instead of looking at someone who perhaps analyzes personalities, why don't you think about what kind of personality does he have? Engage your feelings. And you might find that you come to a more complete understanding of him and his work. We have a sense of what scientists should look like. And unfortunately, they have a sense of what they should produce, not just to us, but to other scientists. This is an extraordinarily tragic slide. Who here has seen this slide? Hmm, not very many people. This is truly a tragedy. This is a report of the O-ring failures in the space shuttle as a function of temperature. And looking at this, it doesn't seem like there's a problem. Does it? Lots of ice here, right? <laughs> you don't see a bear stuck on a little bit of ice. But in fact, there is a problem, and that's hidden in the way that that information is communicated. As the temperature drops, the O-ring failure um, goes up. We don't know. We don't have data for that regime. And so if, if the scientists, if the engineers put up this slide, someone might be interesting, uh, listening with a little bit more attention, and, and unfortunately, uh, people died uh, as a result of that slide. Now, is that a melodramatic way of putting it? Um, I don't think so. But you're thinking, I'm not flying space shuttles. It doesn't matter. Well, but you sometimes go to the doctor. At least each one of you will go to the doctor once. And so what about the information they're looking at? Well, there's a, a study done in which doctors were presented with different kinds of encoding of data, and we're asked to make assessments and decisions about patient treatments based on what they saw. So when the data was presented to them with this icon type graph, they were quite accurate in making decisions. And they weren't very accurate with a pie chart, for example. What's striking is that their preference was quite inversely proportional to their capability of reading the data. So you think you enjoy looking at something and you're making decisions based on it, but you may not be always making the best decision. And uh, you know, physicians have opinions, they're contemptuous. But for the young people in the room, they didn't mind it so much. So, does it really matter what things look like? I mean, what difference does it make? I'm showing you the data. You're not going to have a reaction, an emotional reaction to it, right? The data is the data. 
if I just show you enough data, you're going to reach the right conclusion, right? Because the data is supposed to communicate on its own. Well, if that were the case, <laughs> then, then, then this would not be true. And I assure you that 100% of these 8% don't need more data. And that is an information deficit problem that many scientists think that it's just a matter of more data. But I think people with a more rounded way of looking at it, artists, know that it's not just about data because data shown may appear in a way that does not, is not representative of what it is. Now, imagine that, 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 that statement is that you're actually, you may be seeing things on this slide that is actually not a reflection of what is shown on the slide. And, and you might think that that's really weird because you know, this is not a hallucination. Uh, my eyes are faithful instruments of detection. What I see is what there is. Well, you see probably dots of, of equal color, of the same tone. But when I put color around them, tone around them, suddenly those dots don't appear the same. So you may actually be seeing what is not shown on the screen. Now, this is a fairly extreme example, but you have to be thinking of this. Um, and artists know, for example, that using really bad color combinations has an effect. It's difficult to look at this. And this is put to good use in the cover of this book. It's because it's hard to look at the cover of this book. So look stranger. It's difficult. This is a good choice. Scientists make bad choices all the time when they try to communicate data. And I'm going to be returning to the doctor example. When you use a hue, a rainbow spectrum, if you will, to encode information, the same changes in information can result in changes in color that are small or large. And you might be fooled into thinking something is going on when in fact nothing really is going on that wasn't going on before. It's just reached some threshold completely arbitrary. So this was in the New York Times. And people phoned in. The idea was that if you put a cell phone next to your brain, a part of the brain lights up. But people called in, they were very confused because it looks like the entire brain lit up. Right? It looks like that. It looks like the, the, the brain with the cell phone on is brighter. Well, that's just an artifact of the color scheme. So what the New York Times had to do is they had to put an arrow there to say, this is what we want you to be looking at. Don't pay attention to the other stuff. And so you're thinking, well, it doesn't matter. It's just some brain, some cell phone, right? It's not the end of the world, but it could be. This is an image from NASA about the biggest hole in the ozone layer anybody has ever seen. And it's in color, and it uses hue. So guess what happened when this was in the New York Times? Oh, it wasn't. They couldn't print it because it didn't show up in black and white. <laughs> so, this, so this image was, didn't appear. And, and I, have a, I have a colleague there who tells me these things. Right? So I was, I was horrified. Are you, are you serious? This is an important thing. And you didn't run it because it was a bad color choice. So if, if the NASA people who made the original slide of the O-rings made a different encoding, then the rest of the world would see this. And perhaps they would be compelled to action of some kind or another. So I think it's, it's important to try to think about how data is shown and what kind of an effect data has on people emotionally, intellectually, because the two are inseparable. So there was a beautiful science exhibit at the British Library in London earlier this year, and they, they invited me to create something for it, something, make something. And it's about the tree of life. So I thought, well, OK, there's going to be some phylogenetic trees, and nobody wants to look at those. So let's, let's do some kind of a comparison of the genomes of different animals and, and show the degree to which they differ as you go down the phylogenetic tree. So they, they kind of they, they thought it was pretty good. Um, I worked pretty hard on it, tweaking the data so that it looks just, just so, so that it compels you to look and think about what's going on. There was a really nice interpretive panel that didn't use too many words, but did tell you what was shown and got you to think about the chicken and the platypus. There was another event at the Library of Science during that week where, where I, I don't always have 
people who love me wherever I go. There's some harsh critics. It's not like I'm handing out free cupcakes here. There are people who, who don't agree with my approach. So, so this, this, this uh, Anne I didn't like it. She, she thought it was, the data was corrupted and that the message was gone. The data was, was trying to say something, but I, I gagged it. And, and I was indulgent and unfortunately, ultimately useless, which is kind of hard to, to see that. Uh, ultimately, not, not at the beginning, at the beginning, okay, but ultimately not very useful. So, so there's, there's, this, there's this sense that there's this desire to make things look good, and that desire is, is undoing all of the hard thinking that we're trying to put into our science. People don't want you to do art when you're doing science. They think the two are completely different, and that one will besmirch the other. And not everybody thinks that. Scientists are kind of working in a silo. We, we kind of have a sense that we should be doing what everybody else is doing, and what everybody else is doing isn't particularly looking very good. The idea is that if I make something too pretty, then I can sneak lies, and you won't know, and you'll love it. But if I make something look ugly, then it's got to be true, because there's no sense in showing it. <laughs> right? That seems like good logic. Okay, so this is a slide that shows the efficacy of homeopathy. <laughs> okay, this is the slide that shows the announcement of the detection of the Higgs boson. Okay, they're both really ugly. <laughs> How do you distinguish the two? This is actually the greatest tragedy of science. It's not the slaying of a hypothesis by an ugly fact, but the slaying of a beautiful fact by a slide like this. The amount of work and intellectual effort that went to this slide is phenomenal. It's the Higgs boson. It's the God particle. This says God exists, at least as a particle. <laughs> this is a fairly ugly but campy cover of a book. This is a scientific journal, which is ugly and unfortunately not even campy. <laughs> What's the problem? The problem is that when this happens, we can't tell the junk science from the real science. And as someone who works with scientists and looks at data, it really hurts me to see that brilliant people um, produce things that are so unattractive and, 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 and treat me as a brain in a jar. So we, we try to address this point. Uh, in Nature Methods, we, we have a column that, that runs called Points of View that tells you about what to think about when you're presenting information. I can't tell you the, the tools to use for your data set because I don't know what your data set is. And I understand that it's not always easy to think about showing things visually. So why don't we try to compare it to something that perhaps you know how to do a little bit better, which is maybe writing or maybe speaking. So, you know, maybe Strunk's Elements of Style, which is this slightly stodgy book about how to write. It's got some good ideas. And try to translate this into what do I do visually? So how do I help you make the figure that's on the same side as the pretty dog and not the figure on the same side as the cat? What are the differences here? How do you conceptualize this? How do you look at it? And you know, we went maybe one step further, but we did go one step further, some said too far, and we said, well, instead of just dump, explaining the information, why don't you narrate it? Why don't you distinguish the detail from the minutia, and forget about the minutia, because the minutia can come later, but that first presentation, just tell us what's going on in some kind of a way that you can understand. Well, That didn't necessarily go over very well. All we're saying is, instead of the raw numbers, maybe show us a histogram. Maybe tell us what significance. Give us some insight. I know you've dug the data up. Don't just dump it on me. But that wasn't, that wasn't the case. And this is actually one of the, this was a published argument in Nature Methods about this column. We were essentially called, I think, I think we were called liars. Or I think we were worse. I think we were hucksters of lies. We, we were interpreted that we, should, you should, we were saying that scientists should really sweep inconvenient truths 
under the table, carpet, whatever is available. Um, and that things are complicated. There is no single narrative. Well, yeah, things are complicated. There is no single narrative, but there has to be some kind of a narrative. Otherwise, you'll be overwhelmed. I can't just give you raw data. I have to give you something. That's my job, is to derive some level of insight from what I have found. Otherwise, I'm just a computer terminal. And this is what people are thinking about. They're thinking that, ah, oh, right, he doesn't know what he's talking about, so if he makes it pretty enough, I'm going to think it's right. But the sad, ironic part of this is that I don't have to do that. I could just show you the data and baffle you with it. I can show you real truth. <laughs> this is the way it is. Now, I don't want to get in the way of the data communicating, so I'll just shut up and let you hear the data. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, do I want to play Find Waldo with the data set? I don't. This is a fun pastime. The other thing is more important than a fun pastime. So remember, there were some women speaking during the, the film, and, and one of them said, I don't understand what this mutation encoding means. What is this R259A? What, what, what's going on? I don't understand what this says. Do you think I should whip this out? and tell her, well, you know, cancer is complicated, so stand back, because I'm going to tell you how it is, and it's going to require you know, a long time. But I don't really know what I'm talking about, because nobody does. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this trouble. So, so I'm going to try to make it pretty. But I don't want to make it too pretty, because then you think I'm lying, so I'm going to show you this. <laughs> no, no, that's the, that's the wrong approach. And, and you're laughing, uh, but, but this is what people do. So what would I show her? This is a visual abstract we had to make for a book chapter, which had to be something like 500 pixels by 300 pixels, in which we had to embody what cancer meant, Her cancer heterogeneity. Said, oh, really? That's so many pixels. I've got like so many pixels left over after I'm done. So, so what's, the, what's the essence? Well, the essence is that something is normal. It accumulates mutations, and then cells proliferate, and they expand, and they accumulate mutations as they expand. You go to your doctor, they diagnose you, they treat you. These cells die because the treatment's effective, but not all cells die. Other cells continue expanding. Other cells yet migrate to other organs and continue expanding. Now you think, well, duh. Well, that's not so straightforward. We had to figure this out with a lot of effort. Cancer, there is no such thing as a cancer genome. Every cell in your body even has a different genome than every other cell. So this speaks to that. Now you can think, well, if I'm using a tissue sample and I'm sequencing this tissue sample, I'm really kind of sampling a whole bunch of different cells, aren't I? Yeah. So you're sampling a lot of heterogeneity, and you can't really quite tell what's going on. So if I showed the woman this, this would be a lot more approachable to explaining why we still don't know what's going on. The sense is that, you know, we, 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 there's, a, there's a beauty in the concept that if I want to show you something pretty, I don't need to make it aesthetically pretty in the sense of, of style or design. I'll just show you the raw truth and you're going to be so overwhelmed that you'll cry. That's the real beauty of it. So any mathematician will tell you. I mean, I don't know last time you spoke to a mathematician, um, and, but this is what they'll tell you. So this is arguably the most beautiful equation in mathematics. Can't you just feel it? <laughs> now, I, I can feel it because I've gone to courses where they taught me what these symbols mean. But some of you haven't. And you're looking at it like, yeah, E, I, P, what? Why is that pretty? It's zero. Zero is bad, isn't it? <laughs> so here's something from another Leonard. I always wanted to have a Leonard Cohen quote in one of my talks, and I shoved it in here because I thought it was a good idea. So this is also beautiful, but I don't need to spend two semesters explaining to you why. So what's the difference between the two? What, what, why is this accessible and deep, and the other one is deep but is not accessible? How can we take the other one and make it a little bit more accessible without 
fooling you into thinking that it's not deep. Oh, you know it's deep because you didn't get it. So it's got to be deeper than you, and you think you're deep, so that's deeper. <laughs> well, we're used to a certain approach in science. We're used to saying things in a complex way, and we think that that's a good thing because it reflects the complexity of what we're talking about. And if we make it too simple, then, well, anyone can just do it. The problem is that in physics, the sense of an approximation is one of the first things you learn. In biology, it's impossible to approximate an animal. You can have a model organism, you can use a worm, but a worm is still really complicated. And what biologists fail to do is have the spherical cow approximation. The joke is that you imagine that a cow is spherical and you imagine the absence of gravity in the cow is in a vacuum because it's too, cow is too complicated to model, so it's spherical. And the physicist goes, yeah, that's pretty good. Let's, let's see how far we can get with that. We know that's wrong, but it's right enough for us to get somewhere. Biologists lack this. And so biologists will show you this. I've already shown you this in a visual form, that network. I couldn't know what's going on. Here it is in language form. Now, you probably have a sense that there is something wrong with this, and I shouldn't be showing you this. But the network, if I showed that during a talk, well, OK. Why? Why do you think that this is harder to interpret than the network? This only has, after all, eight words. This is actually a real sentence. There's a whole Wikipedia entry on it. Um, has anybody figured out what it means? No, it's impossible. That's because buffalo is being used with three different meanings. It's an animal, it's a place, and it's an action. And so buffalo, buffalo, day buffalo, 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 buffalo. <laughs> right? That's what it means. But a lot of scientists won't tell you that. They'll tell you the other thing. And you'll be overwhelmed, and you think, I want to be just like you when I grow up. And unfortunately, you will be exactly like that when you grow up. <laughs> they show you this. This is the buffalo chart. And this, is, this, is, this is published literature. This is, this is the kind of journals we all want to publish in. They accept this. They wouldn't accept buffalo, but they accept this. But this is the visual form of buffalo. It's not yet a crime to publish this, but it is unacceptable to publish the buffalo sentence. So we're moving somewhere forward. But this need, it's pretty, and it's true. Is it useful? So we're used, to, we're used to just doing what others are doing. It says click to add title. OK, I'll just add a title, because i got to do it, because it says it. So if I want to make a point, i got to put in a title. I've got to put in these titles, because it tells me to put in these titles. I've got to type something in this box, because what am I going to do if I don't type something in the box? What if I don't have any text? Oh my god, what will they think? They're not going to know what I'm talking about. They're not going to have any kind of reaction. The image will be meaningless. It will be dissociated from the complexity of the issue that I'm trying to communicate. Did anybody notice that two out of four people in that image were smoking? No, eh? Did anybody notice they were smoking? Did you notice that they're smoking now? Uh, because you're too busy reading the text. You missed. The profound sadness of this, it's not just raw sewage, they're smoking. This is probably the healthiest thing that that's, that's appears on this image. So what, is this art? Well, yes. If you know what open form is, closed form, do I put things in a box? Do I not put things in a box? Do I let things spill past the edges? What kind of situation am I trying to communicate? That this sewage just goes on endlessly that the data goes on endlessly, that the concept is really open. Uh, that should have an effect on you. But unfortunately, we're not very good with numbers. We're not very good with proportions. That's why we think flying is not safe. So how can I show this to you? Well, what if I draw the genome? So here's the genome of malaria. OK. And oh. Well, that's pretty cool. It's really small, but it's nasty. Now you're thinking, wait, wait, wait. Back up now. The genome doesn't look like that. Well, yeah. 
if you think I think you think that the genome looks like this, then you're not being a serious audience. You're not being intellectually generous. I'm trying to give you a sense of what the genome might look like. It doesn't look like that. We don't know what it looks like. It looks like a up molecule. So we made this poster about the things that can kill you, and we placed it on an axis, and the things at the top kill everybody that gets it, and the thing on the right kill a lot of people, but not necessarily everybody. And so you can see where Ebola is and how little it is, and you get some information about it, and it presents the genome in some kind of an interpretive way. It makes no attempt to tell you that that's what the genome looks like, but you can learn stuff about the genome from this poster. When you read about how the genome is encoded, you learn about repeat elements, you learn about GC ratios, you start to think about these things, and then you look at leprosy and tuberculosis and you go, oh, that GC ratio is really different, and you wonder why, and all of a sudden we're having a conversation over something that doesn't make your eyes bleed, but that's not entirely a true reflection of reality, because what is a true reflection of reality? A FASTA file? This is pi. Pretty cool, right? Wow. Are you sure it is? Or what if I mix some numbers in there? Would anybody know? No. Did you spot the six nines at the end? It's actually a fairly unique point in pi called the Feynman point. It comes really early. Um, it's difficult to have an engaging conversation over a bunch of numbers because you want me to add something to it. But if I present the same numbers in a slightly artistic way, um, you like it, I hope. And you'll think, oh, that's pretty colorful and it's neat and they kind of look like they're pulsating and what's going on with the purple dots at the end and funny how it's a square and pi is all about things that are round. So it does a bunch of things for you that makes you think about the concepts that you already know. It encourages you to mix ideas in your head. So what do I want to leave you with? Because I can't tell you how to do your job because I don't know what your data set is. I want you to think about what is your spherical cow approximation and be ready to communicate that spherical cow approximation next time you talk to someone and try to explain yourself. And of course, always try to make things even simpler as much as you can at first. Thank you very much. In closing, i um, obviously like to thank Martin for committing time to uh, share with us uh, some very exciting ideas and hopefully uh, we'll see uh, people inspired and we might see some terrific artwork and maybe even people getting published in journals as a result of what you had to say tonight, Martin. Uh, I'd like to thank Illumina and the uh, uh, Victorian Life Sciences Computation Initiative, Michelle Garrett and Helen Gardner, uh, and Beacon Books for providing the books for the Door Prize, thank you. I look forward to seeing you at the next ICT for Life Sciences Forum event. The event wouldn't be possible without our sponsors, so I thank them for their incredible support. Uh, we wouldn't be given the opportunity here, Martin, his colleagues, uh, we wouldn't uh, have a forum. So thank you, sponsors, for your incredible support. And uh, I'll see you very soon. Thank you and good evening.